Let's we'll start with this study, study by Jan Wenström. Jan Wenström took over the department in Gothenburg from Jan Linde, and the hygienists in Gothenburg were used to working with hand instruments. And uh, Jan Wenström was very fond of ultrasonics when he joined the department, but the hygienists were more or less unwilling to change. So he made a deal with them. He said, let's perform a study, and then based on the outcome of the study, we'll decide how we're going to continue. So in this particular study, they uh, took 42 subjects, divided them among two groups. They randomized and stratified them for smoking. One group was given a one-hour full-mouth ultrasonic scanning and root planing, compared to another group which received the normal four one-hour quadrant scaling and planing, root planing. After one month, they got an oral hygiene instruction, reinforcement. At three months, they got a retreatment of pockets that were deeper than five millimeters. In this at this, this time, no time restriction. And at six months, they had the final evaluation. And the number of pockets, the percentage of pockets smaller than four millimeters was 74% on this side and 77 on this side. So there was no significant difference between the two treatments. The conclusion of this study was that a single session of full mouth ultrasonic debridement is a justified initial treatment approach which has benefits for the chronic periodontitis patient. And the benefit is, especially for the professional, that you get the same results in less time. But before you go home and think, uh, that I told you that you should only spend one hour on a perio patient. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what they did in this study, the patient was ready. They turned on the stopwatch. The dental hygienist was working for one hour. Then they stopped the treatment time. So if you would work like this from tomorrow, then you will be finished by the end of the month. So uh, please be aware that you probably need some extra time, but it's more efficient to use a an uh, ultrasonic device. <clears throat> well, as I explained in the previous lecture, I graduated in 1984, and in 1984, there was a change in concepts in Perio. Before that, we were cleaning up a patient and then doing the real Perio treatment, which was flap surgery. And in 1984, a number of papers came out which said that scaling and root planing is very efficient in getting good results in uh, perio patients. <clears throat> a few studies came out from this group. The guy responsible was Jan Egelberg, and in this second study they looked at severely advanced periodontitis cases. <clears throat> there were two people that did the treatment. One was Anita Badersten. She was a dental hygienist. She used to work with ultrasonics. And the other was a periodontist, Rolf Nilvius, and he was used to working with uh, hand instruments. And they said, well, let's compare. So we're having a patient that is treated both ways by two examiners, by two of these professionals. This is Rolf working, and you can tell that the study was performed a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but it, maybe it's good to understand what type of patients they treated. So as a hygienist, you probably want to start to get to work immediately, look at the nice inflammation that you got here, a look at the advanced uh, bone loss that was present at these teeth, and if you compare it to what they did here, I think you can say this was a successful treatment. <clears throat> well, the study was designed as such that a lot of time was spent on oral hygiene. So they started off with three visits on oral hygiene, then they gave, in they gave an instru instrumentation at three months, at six months, and at nine months, and during that time they were all the time reinforcing oral hygiene. And finally, at 24 months, two years later, they did the final assessment. Well, the results are summarized in this graph. Um, these are the pocket depths at the baseline. So these are the c categories that they uh, selected from two and a half millimeters up to 10 millimeters. And on top of this is projected the pocket depth after treatment. So a pocket of approximately 10 millimeters would be reduced to five to six millimeters due to recession. That is what causes some of the 
And what you see here, this makes the pocket less deep. But on the other hand, you'll also get some gain in clinical attachment because the, the collagen fibers are more rigid, more, they provide more resi resistance for the periodontal probe. <coughs> so when you're, you're measuring that the bottom of the pocket is at a higher level, this is reduction. In your cases, if you don't see results from 10 millimeters down to five, six millimeters, then you should evaluate your own treatment. Please be aware, this is in single rooted teeth. So if you, you have a perio patient, this is approximately the amount of effect that you should get within your patients. In molar teeth, it will be different. <coughs> well, this is the pocket depth. This is on average, and when I was teaching at the the School of Dental Hygiene in the past, we were always using this study to explain to the hygienist instrumentation is very effective, but we only gave them hand instruments to work with. If you look at this study in more detail, comparing hand versus ultrasonics, you see that there is actually no difference. So we should have told them whether it's hand or ultrasonics, the effect is the same. Conclusion from this study was when you compare the curette versus the ultrasonic, you see a similar reduction in bleeding, similar reduction in pocket depth, and gain of clinical attachment level. Well, you may ask yourself, how good do you clean a pocket? And uh, this is from a study from the group of Ratajcek, a Swiss guy, and he told his hygienist, I want you to do the best of your ability clean these teeth so before they were extracted to check whether they did a proper job. The hygienists were given a fresh instrument. They were allowed to do five strokes. Then the instrument was sharpened, another five strokes, sharpened again, another five strokes until the hygienist was convinced that the pocket was clean. Well, the tooth is extracted here. What you see is the tissue, which has been colored. This is a scanning electron microscope picture of the same tooth and you see that at the bottom there's still calculus or biofilm present. These are other pictures from the same study. This is where the palatal goes to the approximal, a difficult surface to reach because you need to work around the corner. There's some <coughs> biofilm left also here and here are the bacteria waving at you and telling you that they're still present. <coughs> so um, it shows you that it's very difficult to clean a pocket to make it uh, biofilm free and for this reason if you have a perio patient you need to see them every three to four months in order to clean the subgingival uh, area to uh, make sure that the biofilm does not uh, grow to such an extent that it is pathological again. Well one of the difficulties with cleaning is that instruments uh, yeah, are too big. This is a universal curette. You, you also have these mini curettes, but still, if you look at the blade and compare it to the two surface, it's much bigger than uh, the two surfaces. This is an enlargement. You see that there's a small contact area, and this tip, if you imagine that there's still gingiva around it, this tip is sticking in the gingiva. And if you would be instrumenting, you would be scraping gingival tissue with you. Well, within the word, word curette, there is this scraping of the gingiva, but maybe that's not necessary to do this at all. In the past, when I had maintenance patients, which I had treated, and I, the only intention with maintenance is to remove the biofilm, I would use these instruments. These are files. They are like a perio probe with a little scraper at the end, and this was okay for removing biofilm. <coughs> A study which was, is very important in the field of ultrasonics is a study by Mick Dragu. And what he did is he modified an ultrasonic insert until it had almost the dimension of a periodontal probe. So this is a universal curette. This is a probe. This is his modified insert. And from his study, he concluded that rarely do instruments reach the depth of the pocket, but his of my modified insert did best, you can say. And he, you can summarize his data like this. Here you see three teeth, 
the white, they're stuck in the bone. This is the gingival margin, so this is the pocket depth. And if you would then translate his data to uh, what is clean and what is not clean, then he'd say, well, this provides the cleanest surface, his modified insert. So the explanation for this you might find in this cartoon, which is taken from an advertisement. Here you see the calculus at the bottom of the pocket, enlarged here. And if you imagine removing it with an hand instrument, you need to reach underneath in order to remove it. Whereas if you come from the top, every move you make is actually an active stroke. So reaching down, working your way down, you're already cleaning the two surface if you have an ultrasonic instrument. So probably this is why you reach down deeper with the ultrasonics as compared to a manual curette. And for instance, this case, if you have a pocket like this, which is eight millimeters at this lateral incisor, you already see the gingiva turning white. Try to imagine placing a manual curette down all the way to the, the depth of the pocket. It's much easier if you have a tip like this, and which will reach down and clean this area, and you're not doing any trauma to this pocket. When we talk about ultrasonics, it is what you cannot hear. So that is 20,000 cycles per second. <clears throat> that is some animals, dogs and whales and uh, bats, they can hear sounds above this range, but uh, this is what we can hear as a human being. Um, Please understand that when we talk about ultrasonics, we're talking about sound waves. So it's the energy of a sound wave we're using to clean the tooth surface. And the energy needs to be transmitted from the tip to the tooth surface. <clears throat> well, to be complete, when we talk about mechanical scalars, I think it's uh, wise to start off with to talk about sonic scalars. They work, at, uh, um, they work based on air pressure. To, I have an example here. Um, you attach it to your multiflex attachment of your unit, and then based on air pressure, there's a turbine, and the turbine makes the tip move. But the frequency is, is within the audible range, so uh, the whole product works at a range which you can hear. And to me, this is one of the problems because uh, as we'll see later on, when you listen to the tip, this will help you to understand whether it's working at the correct angle and the correct uh, location towards the tooth surface. The tip moves more or less in a circular fashion because there's a turbine in the handle, so it's not moving, it's not sweeping back and forth. Well, ultrasonics were introduced in dentistry by Cavatron, and the principle of Cavatron is based on, based on magnetostrictive principles, where within the magnetic field you place a metal strip, and when you change the magnetic field, the metal strip will start bending. So there's a few metal laminae within a magnetic field, which is induced by this copper coil, and when you change the electricity, the, the direction, the magnetic field will change, which will make the lamellae to start to move, and finally the tip will move in the more or less forward, but also a little bit sideward direction. <clears throat> well, you probably know that if you have a strip of, met of metal and you bend it quite often, then it will turn warm. So with a cavatron, you need twice as much coolant as with a piezo unit uh, to, be, to cool this, this, uh, these lamellae and also the tip. So the amount of water coolant is twice as much as with the other system, which is piezoelectric electricity. This is based on the principle that if you have a crystal and you put an electric current on it, it will be either become larger or become smaller. So when you change the electric current, it will become larger, smaller, larger, smaller, which will cause a vibration. <clears throat> it was discovered by two brothers. They noticed that when you press on a crystal, you get an electric current. So the principle of a piezoelectric unit is actually 
the reverse, instead of pressing on the crystal, you're putting the electric current on and then it will start to change in dimensions. Well, this is an example of a uh, piezo handpiece where you have ceramic discs, no crystals, but these discs also react to uh, changing the electric current. They look, they look like this. They're in, if you look them up on the internet, they're stuck in many machines. Many ultrasonic machines have uh, discs like this. Well, the vibration is brought over the axis towards the tooth surface, sorry, towards the tip, and then to the tooth surface, of course, and the energy is transmitted as a sound wave over the tip. Um, to explain this a little bit more, I've taken an endo needle and I've stuck it in water. And what you show here is that, what it shows here is that you have these bellies, as you probably remember from high school, and these knots. And at a knot, the tip is not moving. To show this in a little video, uh, this is from Damien Wormsley. This video is a laser a beam video from an ultrasonic tip. This is where the knot is. So if you would touch the tip with this part, with this part of the tip towards the tooth surface, you wouldn't have any effect. So it's only the last two, three millimeters that work. And if the tip shortens, then you lose efficacy. So Use only the very fine end, and then you have the best effect out of your ultrasonic tip. If it breaks, it usually breaks here. And you can imagine that it's bending at this knot all the time. <coughs> Piezoelectric units, they move primarily in a back and forth position. You see it move a little bit to the side if you would take a high speed uh, picture out of it. <coughs> There's various units available. Um, this is EMS, this is, this is a Swiss company, this is Satellite, a French company. Um, all the knowledge concerning ultrasonics is in these two companies. And there's other companies that try to copy the machines. This is, for instance, a Japanese machine. There's also one from Eufridi, and there's probably more. But the knowledge is most of the time a copy out of these machines. And there's so much knowledge in them that if you find um, new products or innovations, you can expect them from these. So if you'd invest in a unit, my advice would be to invest it in either one of these. <coughs> well, most units have a dial which sets the power. And uh, do you have any idea what you do when you turn the dial? Well, if you turn it, you change the amplitude of the tip. So you change the uh, movement of the tip, the amount, the distance over which it moves back and forth. And, um, well, a little bit in, of information about the amplitude. If you increase the amplitude, more substance, more tooth substance is lost. So this says the amount of tooth substance after a treatment, if it's low, medium, or maximum. So. If your aim is to remove calculus, you use it at a higher power than if your aim is to remove biofilm. So instead of setting the dial at a certain position and do all treatments at the same power, it's wise to select whether it's an initial treatment where the aim is to remove calculus or maybe use it at a less power when you want to perform biofilm removal. <coughs> power determines the movement, the amplitude. It does not determine the frequency by which the tip moves. Frequency is the number of moves per second that the tip moves back and forth. So if you combine frequency with amplitude, it's actually the speed of the tip. So it moves at a very high speed back and forth. <coughs> frequency is a given but it's also dependent on the form of the tip. The thicker the shaft, the less frequency you'll get because the metal is thicker. It will not move at such a high frequency as when you have a smaller and thinner tip. 
And the new generation of piezoelectric units has a feedback system that checks frequency and amplitude. And it's like a cruise control on these units. And you'll probably have note if you have one of the newer machines, when you touch the two surface with a tip, you'll probably feel it knocking a little bit harder than when you continue to use. And that is because it sets the amplitude and the frequency. If it's hanging in the air, it's moving at the different frequency and amplitude and when it's touching and feeling resistance. So especially for this, when you're treating a patient, try to stay in contact with the two surface and don't uh, get in contact, move it off, get in contact, and you get the extra hit of the tip all the time. That is very uncomfortable for the patient. There's another dial on your unit which adjusts the water coolant. <clears throat> well, we need water coolant, as I explained, for the Cavitron because you need to cool the metal lam lamellae, but we also need to cool the tip because if you wouldn't cool it, you'd burn your fingers and you also burn the gingiva and the pulp of the tooth. So when you work, you need to have sufficient amount of water uh, and make sure that you don't heat up the tissues. Um, when I was preparing this lecture, I uh, tried to make some videos, and uh, by chance, I came across a situation where I was having too little uh, coolant. The music is to make it more exciting. <laughs> If you look at the, uh, turn it off a little bit. If you look at the spray, it's up here. It's not at the tip. And if you look more closely, you see what's happening. So I'm working, and uh, I wasn't watching too well under the microscope, and continued. And then, uh, when I looked at the, the microscope, gets upset here because it, it, the, the white balance is all up upset, but you can see I damaged the gingiva. And so if you don't have sufficient coolant, make sure that you... Yeah. If you don't have sufficient coolant, this is what the damage that you may call, cause. So, yeah, I didn't do this on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is a nice phenomenon when you have the coolant. This is a tip which is immersed in water, and what you see is that at the end, you see these little bubbles develop. Well, the bubbles is what is called cavitation. And cavitation is, uh, when you look at the definition, is the formation of vapor cavities in flowing water. If you move something fast through water, behind it you'll leave cavities which will implode and with the implosion you'll have a lot of energy come free. In the dictionary it is described in relation to ship propellers. It can cause corrosion when they're made of bronze or metal and uh, I've read one review uh, on the internet where it said if you have a cruise ship which disembarks on a maiden voyage by the time it returns to the harbor uh, back home they have to replace the propellers because they have had so much corrosion from turning in the water. So you can imagine that this corrosion might help you to, no, the corrosion, this implosion might help you to clean the surface. This is a little video that is uh, from somebody I know at the university in the Netherlands who is taking high-speed films of cavitation implosions, and you can see the amount of yeah, force that is suggested with this video. But it's not one bubble that comes out, it is actually a lot of bubbles that cause the effect. And taken from an advertisement, it says the energy in any one bubble is, bubble is negligible, but the effect of millions of these cavitation bubbles is to literally blast the plaque from the surface. But then it continues and says, and tear apart bacterial cell membranes in the process. Some companies say that if you have an ultrasonic unit, you also get an antimicrobial effect. And this is based on what you'd get in the lab laboratory. If you have a mixture of bacteria, you're interested in the DNA. You sonicate this mixture, and then the cells will break, and you can extract the DNA. So people have thought that if you 
move the tips up gingerly, you might also have an antimicrobial effect. And with this uh, expression goes these, goes these pictures. These are the cavitation bubbles, and these are the bacteria that explode. <clears throat> well, there's a few studies. One of the studies that uh, compared hand instruments versus ultrasonics concluded that based on microscopic and cultural data, there's no difference between hand and ultrasonic debridement after three months. So although it's suggested that there's an antimicrobial effect, you won't find it uh, present in your patients. Well, you can work with the tip dry, so without coolant, or you can add the coolant. And if you work dry, this is what the effect will be. This is the mechanical effect of the tip going over the surface, going mostly back and forth and a little bit to the side. But if you then add the coolant, this is the effect that you get. So you get more out of treating with an ultrasonic unit and water coolant. And before you go home and think you can do this with calculus, and this was a study performed with biofilm with plaque. So uh, when you have biofilm removal, the cavitation effect might help you. And probably when you've worked in patients where there's a lot of plaque on the surfaces, and you start treating, you'll see that it's almost yeah, removed beyond the tip. So you get a lot more effect out of the coolant. <clears throat> Some companies, they go so far that they say, well, actually, you don't need to touch the two surfaces anymore. This is a, an ultrasonic brand that says what you're trying to create within a pocket is like what you would have with an ultrasonic bath. So you just stick in the tip and then the probe does the rest. So this is the tip, this is the streaming, this is the cavitation which you have at this calculus, sur calculus on the surface, but I got this video from them, but if you wait a little bit longer, you see what happens when they touch the surface. So if, well, and now I'm convinced that you should touch the surface. <laughs> and, uh, and doesn't work like they suggest that it works. <clears throat> Well, you can also add some antimicrobials to your coolant. Antimicrobials such as betadine solutions, such as hydrogen peroxide. Uh, some people have added chlorhexidine to it. And yeah, there have been suggestions that it might provide a benefit. Um, if you do it and you want to bring the coolant and the antimicrobial all the way down, there's one study that has looked at the penetration of this antimicrobial, and they say, well, it goes to the full extent of the probing pocket. It provides coolant at the tip of the instrument, so actually it's working its way down along the uh, vibrations. But it has a limited dispersion beyond the path of the tip, so deliberately should be dependent on the thorough instrumentation. So you need to go through all the corners of the pocket in order to deliver the antimicrobial there. Well, whether it provides any additional effect, there has been some dispute. Some studies say it does, some studies say it doesn't. And uh, I, I was in a positive mood tonight, so I thought, let's look at the study that says that it has a significantly greater reduction in probing sites, initially measuring four to six millimeters. Um, but if you use chlorhexidine in your unit, then the the piping which is in your unit will get clogged by the sticky ultrasonic substance. So you need to rinse it very thoroughly after each chlorhexidine treatment and maybe rinse it with a vinegar solution at the end of the week as well in order to clean them up. I started off by treating all my patients with chlorhexidine and then after six months all my units were in repair. And uh, So what I'm doing right now I use it for initial treatment, especially whenever I decide to also support my initial treatment with antibiotics. So if I go for an antimicrobial approach, then I put the chlorhexidine in the units and then add uh, antibiotics after the initial treatment. <clears throat> There's one aspect which you need to consider, and that is cost-benefit. Uh, for a full initial treatment, you probably need eight bottles of uh, chlorhexidine. And you can imagine uh, that it will add to the costs of your treatment. We have these gallons 
um, which we, we use. This is uh, an 0 0.12 solution, and we dilute it by half. So you add a, si a similar amount of water, so you end up with 0 0.06. Uh, you can also take 0 0.2 and dilute it down to 0 point, 0 0.05. Then you're okay. So it's uh, one quarter of chlorhexidine, three quarters of demineralized water. If you go home, demineralized water. If you put in tap water, you get crystal forming and the chlorhexidine doesn't work. So you dilute with demineralized water. So what have we seen? Coolant is necessary to cool the handpiece, especially in case of, of magnetostrictive units and to cool the scalar tip. It helps to flush out the pocket it has additional cavitation effect. There might be an antimicrobial effect, but we were unable to show it in scientific research. And it clears the area, it improves the visibility. I really like to work with ultrasonics because there's not that much blood when you're working there and it's easier to see. <clears throat> but there has been one concern. If you have a coolant, you might induce an aerosol. And whenever you read a review paper, they refer to this study. But have a look. The study is from 1967. In 1967, there was no high-volume evacuator. They just had these little things which you placed in the corner of a mouth. The study was performed where they went to London. They, there were two practices, two period practices. One that used only hand instruments. The other practice used only ultrasonics. And they noticed that in the practice that used ultrasonics, there was a 30-fold increase of the bacterial count in the air. <clears throat> but there were no piezoelectric units. There were no high-volume evacuators. So we performed a study where we treated the patient, and we placed culture discs at the distance of 0.4 meters to their the head and one at 1.5 meters. We cultured aerobically, looking at bacteria that like oxygen, and anaerobically looking at bacteria that don't like oxygen, and we found no increase, no increase of the uh, bacteria in the air, and we used this evacuator. So uh, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Uh, this is the, the, the reference to aerosol increase probably comes from the past, when we didn't have evacuators that were working like we want them to work. <coughs> but when you use an evacuator, you'd like to see a mist like this around your instrument. And what you recognize if you look at the mist is what I explained at the beginning. Where the mist is coming off, that's where there's a belly in the sound wave. This is where the knot is, and there's another knot, and this part is moving. But if you hold an evacuator close to it, you'll see the mist move this direction instead of going down. So this is an evacuator. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. It's probably old. It's the, the first Dürr evacuator. But these are called the Bambinos, the little children from this one. <laughs> and um, the opening is quite OK. It's, it is perfect. So it doesn't suck away the mist, which is there and it is enough to clear the oral cavity. And then there's these extensions which help you to retract the teeth, sorry, the cheek and the, the, <laughs> the tongue. And the, the nice things, they're, they're recently they've come in various colors, which it brightens, <laughs> up your, brightens up your day when you start to work every morning. <clears throat> Within the protocol that I have in my practice, just to make sure that there's no increase, I ask a patient to rinse for one minute with chlorhexidine before I do the treatment. So they're asked to rinse with chlorhexidine. <coughs> this reduces the salivary bacterial load for 97% for 60 minutes during subgingival debridement. So patient comes in, rinses for a minute, then we treat. This is in the protocol. If you don't put it in the protocol, it just gets lost. So it's strict. Every patient knows this. They already walk to the sink uh, to do the rinsing. Let's talk a little bit about side effects. 
some people have been concerned saying, well, um, especially in the 1980s, if you had a subgingival infection, there would be bacteria. The bacteria would leave remnants on the surface, maybe endotoxins, products of bacteria which might interfere with the healing afterwards. So they said, well, maybe ultrasonics is not doing a very good job in removing these endotoxins. But in a publication from Charles Kopp, where he summarized all there is to know about non-surgical pocket therapy, he says that endotoxins are lightly bound to the root surface and therefore easily removed. And he suggests that especially the cavitation and the microstreaming from so ultrasonics is particularly effective. So uh, if endoto endotoxins is your worry, I wouldn't worry too much about it if you use ultrasonics. Then there are, of course, effects on the tooth surface. <clears throat> Let's first have a look at enamel. A study which says that instrumentation has a damaging effect on enamel, particularly severe at the CAJ. Instrumentation in general. This concerns ultrasonics, hand instruments, but also air abrasion. And this is what you'll see. So the CAJ, which used to lie here, is now located there. This is a smoker that came in every three months for a cleaning to remove all the brown stain. And by cleaning this all the time, you see a change of the CAJ. Here, the enamel is already loose from the under underlying tissue. So next time we'll treat him, this will come up. And this is not only in my cases, because if you take this picture in your, place it in your mind, you'll come across it in your own patients as well. And especially with air abrasion, it has been described that because the enamel is so much more rigid than the dentin, you'll undermine the enamel at the CAJ, and the next time you treat it, the enamel will come up. So if you don't need to do it, uh, stay away from the cement to enamel junction. A picture which explains the effect on the root surface. <coughs> UT stands for untreated. This is untreated root dentin. And you see that from nature, it isn't smooth. It has what they describe as an undulating effect. It has, it has these little hills and valleys, but there's also a certain roughness. If you use a hand instrument, you will flatten the surface, but it will also leave yeah, some, some roughness behind when you compare it to what you can do with an ultrasonic scaler. Here you see that the su surface, there has not been surface removal, but there has been some form of burnishing. You actually compress the surface a little bit. And yeah, to me, this might be an advantage, especially when you consider sensitivity after treatment, since you're not removing any uh, tooth substance, sensitivity might be less. Also, root carriers on the long run might be less. Because whenever you scrape away a layer of the dentin, you're opening up the dental tubules, which towards the pulp are becoming wider. And that allows bacteria to enter these tubules. So there's, I think, an advantage if you consider um, the burnishing effect it might have. And then there's one study that looked at the effect on the pulp, and it says that you need to assure proper water flow to minimize possible pulp damage. <clears throat> well, this was a study performed in cats. Um, the teeth are much smaller than a human tooth, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. In fact, we performed a study where we first instrumented, uh, where we had a, a, a tiny thermometer in the tooth, we first instrumented without any coolant, then you saw an increase of temperature up to 10 degrees. But if you had coolant taken from tap water, which would be approximately 20 degrees, you would actually see uh, a cooling of the tooth because the, the tap water is cooler than the original temperature of the tooth itself. Well, sufficient water flow with a piezoelectric unit should be that you see the mist coming from the tip. If you have an ultrasonic unit with a like a cavitron, you need more water, and then you need to see these little droplets fall off. You need about twice as much coolant with a cavitron as compared to a piezo unit. <clears throat> when we look at restorative materials, 
this is amalgam and enamel. This is the margin of the restoration. If you instrument on the margin, this is the damage that it might do. Also on composites, you'll see a similar effect, especially at the margins. But move a tip across a composite filling and you'll see a black stripe after. So you're also losing metal from your tip. So I wouldn't, yeah, if it's not necessary, I would stay away. And there, there was a question lately, wh what the effect on, uh, for instance, porcelain, porcelain crowns is. Uh, there's little information about it. It's, it's on my wishing list to do. But I expect that if you instrument, especially at the margin, you might some do some damaging there as well. <clears throat> then if you instrument implants, if you have these titanium surfaces, you'll have scratches and this will induce extra uh, adherence of plaque and calculus. Some <coughs> instruments have these nice carbon fiber tips. Uh, this one I particularly like. It's like a probe and you can stick it in between the gingiva and the implant restoration. I usually find it very difficult uh, to instrument at all between an implant restoration and the gingiva. So this is a nice one to use. <laughs> one in Dutch, uh, because I don't have it in, uh, this is for your learning, uh, some of the Dutch. Um, this, is, this came with New Year's Eve, so we have a lot of fireworks, and uh, you in Sydney as well. Uh, what it tells you is the, ab the amount of sound that you get from uh, an ultrasonic. Tip. It's approximately at 80 decibels. Uh, this, this is the Dutch word for vacuum cleaner. So it's approximately the amount that you get with a vacuum cleaner. So there's no danger with respect to uh, impairing your hearing when you use an ultrasonic unit. Although some of my hygienists are working with these little plugs because they don't like to hear the sound all day. So they, they, they say they get a headache. So I, I personally don't hear anything at all. <laughs> so I probably blocked it out from my, uh, my hearing. But they say, well, I prefer to have these little earplugs which block out the high frequency sound. It, those are the same earplugs you use when you are a motorcyclist. Which, uh, that is the ones they were made. And this is a pop concert, which is 140 decibels. That's far more dangerous. <coughs> okay. What about using the tips? When you use a tip, you should use it at an angle wherever possible parallel to the tooth surface. Parallel means that you use the sweeping motion of the tip. You hold it parallel to the surface. It will help you to remove the debris which is on the surface. Do not point the tip towards the surface. To explain this, you hold the tip at a, at a slight angle towards the tooth surface and you touch with the last two, three millimeters. I explained this at the beginning. This is where the effect is. And then above this, you'll get to the knot and then it stops working. So this is how you should place it. Make sure that you follow the contour of a tooth. Going down you'll, towards the apex, you'll need to tilt the tip more towards the apex of the tooth. So make sure that you follow the contour and that you're always in contact with this last two, three millimeters. Don't point the tip towards the tooth, uh, then you'll need to fill it afterwards. And, uh, okay. <coughs> also don't use the front of the tip. If, because I was explaining it's moving in a back and forth direction, now it's knocking on the tooth. And uh, that's, this is very uncomfortable for the patient. Sometimes, if you have to clean the very distal aspect of the tooth, you can reach over the tooth and then use the inner part of the tip. So it's, it's coming back. This is not so uncomfortable for the patient, and it will be difficult to uh, instrument the distal aspect of the last molar when holding it parallel. So then you can use the inner aspect of the instrument. But don't, never use the front. A patient won't like it, and if you listen to it, it will make a lot more noise than if you hold it parallel to the surface. This explains a little bit what happens if you increase the angle. 
So if you point the tip towards the tooth, you will remove a lot more tooth substance when you compare it to uh, parallel placement. <clears throat> Do not press too hard because gentle is more effective and use your ears to feel what the tip does. You can hear whether it's positioned at the right angle towards the tooth surface. <clears throat> I think one of the main advantages of an ultrasonic tip is that you use less power as compared to a hand instrument. And when I translate this back to my own practice, when I started off by having the hygienist work with hand instruments, I had a lot of problems with uh, wrist problems, had thumb problems. So I think it helps to uh, also for strain on, on your muscles and your wrist that you uh, have an ultrasonic instrument to work with. To explain a little bit how you should use your ear, this is a metal surface and just practice it once at home. When you hold it parallel, there's very little sound coming off from the tip. And then if you change the angle, you'll hear that it increases the sound. So when you work, try to have as li little sound as possible. Then use overlapping strokes when you work. So. Uh, I'll show this in a little video and move the tip continuously so that you don't heat up the area where you're working but don't use it, move it too fast. The tip is moving far much faster than you can ever move it so move it slowly and make sure that you touch all the uh, tooth surfaces in the pocket and stay in contact with the surface. This is a little video this is an instrument I like very much because it resembles a Perio probe. This is a tip I use yeah, quite fondly for maintenance treatment. So you can probe with it, check whether you're at the right position, and then start using it. And I start at the bottom of the pocket and work my way up. <clears throat> and although it may seem like I'm using it at a high speed, it's enlarged, it's in a microscopic uh, video. So. so you see I'm surging my way and making sure that I reach all aspects of the subgingival area. And then try to keep in direct view wherever possible. And direct view, I mean, if you work as a hygienist, you probably need to use the evacuator in one hand and the handpiece in the other hand, or you have an assistant. I don't know how comfortable you are working here. Um, my hygienists don't have an assistant, so they have to uh, do all the evacuating themselves. So then you need direct view, and direct view you can have by make, sitting in the right position. If you, you make sure that you can see the buckle aspect on the first and fourth quadrant, then you can work your way towards the lingual aspect and then change positions and then go from the buccal aspect in the second and fourth to the lingual aspect in there. So you don't need to move the patient around too much. Uh, just a little tip. When you move towards the approximal aspect of a tooth, uh, I said you should try to be in a parallel position to the tooth. If you would be sitting with your tip towards the tooth, you'd need to change the angle all the time. So your hand would be like this for the buccal surface and then going to the approximal surface, buccal, approximal. It's easier to reach over the tooth with your tip and then twist it between your fingers. So what I'm doing here is I'm reaching over and then twisting the tip towards the approximal aspect. If you work like this, it's only tiny movements of your fingers that are necessary in order to adjust it to the tooth surface. So that's the way I work. I try to work over the teeth. So try it and maybe it can help you in your everyday practice when you work with ultrasonic instruments. When we look at the Perio protocol, what we have for treating our patients, there's various steps in the protocol. There's the active phase, there's the surgical phase, and we have the maintenance phase. And for all these phases, we have different tips. <clears throat> so if your aim is to remove calculus, you remove the tip, you use the tip with the thicker shaft as compared to the smaller shaft, which you can use for the maintenance. So the two units that I work with, and I, I don't know what you're working with, but I understood that both of these are available. These are the thickest tips for both these brands. 
They are for super gingival debridement. They are powerful tips for calculus removal, but sometimes they are too powerful for the patient. So with these tips, I never use. The hygienist uh, use the smaller tips. These can be used at medium to high power because you want to remove calculus. <clears throat> these are the tips we use the most in the practice. It's a slimmer tip. It's a tip which is can be used for supra, both supra and subgingival debridement, uh, subgingivally up to three to five millimeters. It's moderately powerful, and you can use it at medium and high power. This is a, an even slimmer one. It has an elliptical form, which allows you to clean, use the sweeping motion to clean. You can use it in the active phase of periodontal treatment. You can use it all the way down to the bottom, bottom of the pocket. It's the least powerful tip used at medium setting. Uh, you can use the same tip also for maintenance. Then you go to the low and medium setting. But the one I prefer for maintenance are the tips which are rounded. So there's no, there's the, the least damage done to the tooth surface, but you do remove the biofilm with these tips, also used at low and medium settings. <clears throat> these are from Satellec, uh, the French brand. This is actually a 10 millimeter probe. This is a 15 millimeter probe. So if you have, if you're probing, you can also use these tips, and they have these nice curved tips as well, which you can use to get into uh, furcation areas. Uh, with respect to the curved, I prefer for furcation areas these tips from EMS. They have this little ball, ball at the end. I was explaining that if you work with the tip of the instrument, you might do damage to the tooth surface. Because of this little ball, there's less damage being done. So if you get the tip in the furcation, you can use the ball to clean the surface which is there. <clears throat> they're moved, used for furcations, concavities, and they're intended for subgingival debridement, and they have the least power. So this is a, an example of the tip that's being used. This is... If you would expect that you try to get into a furcation with a hand instrument, sometimes the blade is so wide that you can get it in, but you cannot move it. And if you can get the furcation tip in, it's working. It's doing, it's cleaning already. It's actively working. So uh, especially in furcation areas, I love these ultrasonic instruments. And this is an, ex an explanation from the EMS company how it should be used. And I think I, yeah, there is a little video which shows an example. So you see this is almost like a furcation probe, the tip that is being used. So again, this is the first molar at the distal. You can see where we're probing first, finding the furcation entrance. Try to imagine getting into this furcation area with a hand instrument. That would almost be impossible. And you can see that yeah, just by trying cleaning, trying to clean it like this, you can at least have some effect uh, in this furcation area. Uh, furcations are a periodontal nightmare, so it just really reduces the prognosis of teeth. These I like very much. This is the latest development. This is a periodontal probe which has this calibration, and these tips also have the calibration on it. So a 10 millimeter and 50 millimeter tip. And if we look at the video, it's the same music all the time. I should say, <laughs> I should work on these videos again. Yeah, yeah. Here you're probing, and um, you can check the pocket around the tooth. So it reduces that you need to change from a, a probe to a tip all the time. So by just probing, you can tell. Well, this is the depth of the pocket, and by the time you have explored it, you can turn on the uh, ultrasonic power and start cleaning the incident, so the subgingival aspect. Okay. Then, if you are doing surgery, uh, I personally love these instruments. These are similar tips, but they have this diamond coating. But never use this 
uh, as a hygienist when you don't see what you're doing. Otherwise, you'll be removing a lot of tooth tissue. These are the tips from Satellec. Uh, just an, an example. This is a distal of a last molar. My hygienist did her ultimate best to clean this, but sometimes it's very difficult. Can you imagine that I should have to clean this as well with hand instruments? I'd be working a long time on this as well. So having these diamond coated instruments, it's very easy to clean it and yeah, this looks nice and shiny and uh, I really love this as a periodontist. Okay, the latest development in ultrasonic techniques is, are these units, they're used for, they're not the same as the ultrasonic used for subgingival debridement, they're used for bone surgery. You can use them for instance for crown lengthening procedures, you can use them for making a lateral window. What is so nice about an ultrasonic unit is that if you have a tip, it goes through a firm substance, but the moment it reaches something stop, soft, it stops. So if you have a lateral window, you work through the bone, the moment you reach the Snyderian membrane, it stops. If you do a crown lengthening, you work through the bone, you reach the periodontal ligament, it stops. So you don't touch the tooth. <clears throat> There's there is various tips. These are bone scrapers to harvest bone. This is a periotome which you can use to extract teeth. These are for lateral windows and these are for bone corrections. Uh, I, I use these quite a lot, I must say, for bone corrections with crown lengthening procedures. And this is just an example with a lateral window where you can see that the tip is actually preparing the bone here. Uh, although it's, uh, you wouldn't expect too much because it's vibrating, it's actually cutting away the bone. And uh, we won't go all through the whole procedure of the lateral window because it takes a little while to go there. Then for the dentist among us, uh, if you use um, an irrigation solution and then put in the ultrasonic tip, the ultrasonic needle as I'm showing here, there's a, you increase the efficacy of your irrigation solution by 30 times, that has been shown. Because you heat up this irrigation solution, uh, if you use the sodium hypochlorite, then the effect is very much increased. There's also tips you can use for your ap apicorectomy. Uh, you can make these nice preparations at the apex of a tooth, and that prevents that you get uh, a gunshot wound after you've done an apocectomy. When you look at the, the picture, you sometimes see this shot of amalgam sitting all over the, the radiographs. <clears throat> Other tips for endo treatment. This is one to remove posts. These are for searching for additional canals, and these are also used for opening the, uh, of creating an endodontic opening. The nice thing about this, because uh, last night I was uh, also lecturing, somebody asked me why should I use the ultrasonics? Because it's not rotating, it's not looking for, it's, it, you, it's only where you have, are in contact with the surface, it's working. So it's not finding its way, searching its way, so that you end up through the bottom of the pulp chamber, uh, but stay in place. And this is especially nice for opening uh, the root canal preparation. Just a little warning, this is the, uh, the very first ultrasonic unit I bought. Um, this is a tip that was new, this I had been using for a year. So it loses material and all the units have these little cards and the cards tell you when you should uh, stop using the tip. And how it works I don't know, but when it becomes shorter it loses efficacy. So make sure that by the time you reach the red line that you replace your tip. So they don't last a lifetime. This book is available uh, also in English. It's The Power of Ultrasonics. Um, I, I noticed that it's available in this library as well if you want to buy it. It's uh, published by Quintessence. If you, uh, you uh, enter on uh, Amazon.com Power of Ultrasonics, that's what you get. It's not expensive. It contains a lot of more information than I gave tonight, and it's uh, a nice summary of my lecture. <laughs>